Hey friends, welcome back. Day two in the garage with the Chevelle. Today, we're gonna to be dealing with cold start tuning on the fuel injection system that I installed in this car. I don't get much opportunity to, to do tuning at 30 some degrees. So uh, we're gonna do that today and see if I can get that dialed in. Now, if you own a motorcycle and you don't own a car, you still wanna watch this. Believe it or not, the principles and the settings and the method of developing maps for fuel injection are exactly the same on this car as it would be on your motorcycle. So stay tuned, you'll get something out of it. So one of our viewers was nice enough to mention my, my hair from the second part of yesterday's video. So we're gonna keep the hat on today. And uh, well, keep my head warm too, it's still a little chilly. But anyway, so the principles of, of developing a base map from scratch on this car are exactly the same as they are on the motorcycle. You have the same things to deal with. You have a priming, you have the cranking fuel, you have the after start fuel, then you have your the, the temperature enrichment, and so that it, all the tables are ex the same, the principles are the same. Everything exists. Now, an interesting challenge with the Chevelle that we see, we're, we're used to seeing all the time, uh, most of the base maps that come with fuel injection systems are, are designed for moderate performance to stock. You know, somewhere around one horsepower per cubic inch, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, where fuel injection gets more complicated is, is when you far exceed the power output that the base map was designed for. So engines, when they're cold, is it's uh, high demand for fuel uh, when you're trying to hit that switch and getting the, the ignition timing, the fuel delivery in all aspects of that can be extremely difficult and a lot of times frustrating. You know, for some of our, our even larger builds where a challenge comes in is, is sizing a fuel injector. So let's say for example, you know, we're building one of our 250 plus horsepower you know, supercharged engines or turboed engines, well, the, the it makes it even more difficult because there's no base maps that exist. So you have to do it completely from scratch. The other challenge with that is there's a very delicate balance with fuel injector sizing. You need to have enough injector up top, higher RPM range to be able to support the, the power output of the engine, but not have too big of an in injector down low at idle and cold start because you can flood the engine out in a in a split second and it's putting out uh, right at 700 horsepower that requires a tremendous amount of injector so let's put it into perspective let's say you know we're, we're used to talking on your harleys on all of your cable drive up to 2007 they were 3.91 gram per second injectors uh, from like 05 to 06 okay the very first generation was 4.35 gram per second. So you went from 4.35 on the 46 millimeter throttle bodies anyway, you went from a, a 4.35 gram per second, then it went down to a 3.91 gram per second. And then that went back to a 4.35 when your fly by wire 50 millimeter throttle bodies came out. So when you do a build, you know, again, a moderate average, you know, street performance build, you might have to go as big as a six gram per second. But then when you step into the M8s and they're capable of making so much more power, you need a seven gram per second or maybe even a little more than that. Now, when we do these big, you know, performance builds, big ones that are putting out again, almost two times the displacement, you know, horsepower per cubic inch thing, then you, we in some cases have to have injectors custom made to the point that we're running 10 and 12 gram per second, which is an enormous injector. And again, it's that balance, having too much fuel at crank and idle versus having enough fuel up top. So it can be tough to manage. And then you have other things like uh, fuel pressure regulators that, are, that reference manifold pressure that will increase fuel pressure as the manifold pressure changes, and that will deliver more fuel and allow you to run a smaller injector. But this car, to put it into perspective, because of the power output, I'm running four injectors in this car, and they are rated at 100 pounds per hour. So 100 pounds per hour is right at 12 and a half grams per second. So 12 and a half grams per second times four, okay? Now, if you consider the horsepower and displacement that I mentioned there, if we reference back to your Harley, you know, if we're putting out 
you know, roughly 150 to 200 horsepower, then we would need somewhere around a 10 gram per second injector when you start getting up to 250 horsepower. So that's kind of the injector sizing. So my challenge with this car is no different than the challenge that you have on a motorcycle, where I have a tremendous amount of fuel when this thing is cold. It's under, if ambient air temperature is under, say, 70 degrees, 60 to 70 degrees, it's flooding out pretty bad. Uh, once the engine temperature is above that, she seems to crank and run just fine. So just like I would have to do on your Harley, I have a lot of dialing in to do on the cold start enrichment, and we're going to go through each table individually and explain what each one of those does. So let's get started. For the car, I chose the Holly Sniper EFI system. Now, there's other systems out there that are multi-port, that where you have an injector, you know, at each intake port. But I chose that system for a couple of reasons. One, the the manifold that's on the the intake manifold that's on this car is a low-rise manifold. It was already chrome plated and all that, so it looked nice. I knew I was making plenty of power anyway. So, but what I the way the Holly Sniper system works is it's it's technically a throttle body, but it has what looks like a carburetor that you can typically you know, bolt up to a four bolt spread board type intake manifold, sort of a universal fit sort of thing. And then it has the four ejectors on the inside of the throttle body. The other reason I did it is because the computer system is actually built into the throttle body itself. So I, I didn't want to have to run a bunch of other harnesses and things to, uh, to and then worry about mounting a e separate ECM somewhere and that sort of thing. So that's why I chose the Holly Sniper system. So again, we're going to go through each table on, on setting up a fuel injection system. The tables that are used in this car are exactly the same as the tables that are used on your motorcycle. Now, I'm going to describe what each one does, but the, the, the name of the table itself may be slightly different, but in functionality, they all do the same thing. So let's take a look at everything we have here. All right, so let's start with the fuel side of things. All right, you have what's here, a volumetric efficiency table, which is the ECM's way of determining how efficient the engine is at handling the incoming air versus the fuel. So the higher the volumetric efficiency of the engine, it's going to supply more fuel. The next you go into your fuel graph. It's just a visual representation of your volumetric efficiency table. Your learn table, because this is a full closed loop full fuel management system, it is essentially like a what you would call a block learn multiplier table. So as the system is reading the air fuel ratio values, it's comparing that to the command air fuel ratio and applying a multiplier so that it can achieve the desired air fuel ratio. So this is an ever changing number. It will be plus or minus whether it's adding or subtracting fuel again to modify the, the, the volumetric efficiency table. So the way that the math works is it has the base volumetric efficiency table, it looks at the command air fuel ratio, then the learn table is that fully active modifier. Multiplying all of those together is what determines the actual pulse width of the injector and how much fuel is delivered. Then you get into your target air fuel ratio table. Now this one is relatively basic at this point. The I've, I've put these values in as just a base to get me started. So basically, if we're looking at this 14.7 area here, that is your cruise and roll-on area. Roll-on, I'm talking about motorcycles here. Uh, so this is your manifold pressure over here in kilopascals, which is the metric version uh, of inches of mercury. I like working in KPA. Then you have your engine RPM. This area over here is your D cell and idle area and very, very light throttle, steady state cruise. This car idles at around 70 kPa, so it's going to idle about here with an air fuel of 13.8. I'm actually going to lean this out once I get the car tuned uh, to probably around 14.1. And in this area up here, the 96 to 105 is full load, not necessarily wide open throttle, but full load on the engine. 12.5 is a bit rich. Big block Chevys tend to, to, to like to run a little bit richer. Now on your Harley, your cruise range, because it's an air-cooled engine, the only way that you have to uh, to deal with 
with engine temperature as well with ignition timing and fuel. We don't necessarily have a full cooling system. So on a Harley, you're going to be somewhere around 14.1, 14.3. Idle would probably be around 13.8, give or take. And wide open throttle could be anywhere from 12.5 to 13.2, 13.4 in some cases to achieve the best power output. Next, you have your acceleration enrichment. So when you, when you hit the gas, then it needs an extra squirt of fuel. So that is your acceleration enrichment. And you can see it's based on rate of change of the throttle position sensor. And then this is pounds per hour enrichment here. So you can see that that's a curve. Now built into this, all of this changes as well and gets even more complicated. This chart can change relative to engine temperature. So the colder the engine is, you need more acceleration enrichment. As the engine heats up, you don't need as much enrichment. Now this is a multiplier of the TPS rate of change table. Then you have the acceleration enrichment correction versus the TPS. So this is, again, based on several factors in the algorithm and how it modifies fuel just for acceleration enrichment. Then you also have one that's acceleration enrichment based on rate of change in manifold pressure. So when you, if you hit the gas rapidly, you can see this down here is KPAs per second. If you hit it rapidly and you have a rapid increase or decrease in manifold pressure, then it will also modify the amount of fuel sprayed during your acceleration enrichment. Then you have one that's time versus coolant, and you also have one that's just coolant. So it's uh, the acceleration enrichment is very important uh, to avoid any dead spots or, or lean spots when you first hit the gas. Then of course you have temperature enrichment. So you crank the car, this is a multiplier of that fuel table and will enrich in the fuel. It's basically a choke. Uh, it, for fuel injection is how this works. So you can see how as engine's colder, the enrichment percentage tapers off and tapers off and tapers off. And when you hit 160 degrees, close to normal operating temperature, it's at 100%, so that means there's zero multiplier being added. Now my challenge with this car is, again, the injectors are so big. What I think is going on is I have too much enrichment in it once it, once it gets running. So I'll probably have to pull this down a little bit. And you also have what's called an air fuel ratio offset. This is a this is a modifier of the command to air fuel ratio. So if you have your offset air fuel over here and you have coolant temperature over here, you'll see at 140 degrees where it says zero all the way up to 260. Now what this is telling us is that I have my command air fuel set at 13.8. That means with zero modifier, that is my command air fuel. But if the engine is at 120 degrees, you'll see the minus 0.3 here. What this means, since I have 13.8 at idle, it's going to subtract that and give me a target air fuel of 13.5. Same here, 13.5. This would be 13.2 and 13 and so on. Then you have an air temperature enrichment. Of course, the colder the air is, you need to richen the fuel even more. All right, then we get into the startup enrichment. So this is the cranking fuel. This is the amount of fuel that is delivered in pounds per hour relative to engine temperature only while it's cranking. This is probably, again, way too much fuel. So I'm probably gonna have to pull some of this back down, but I, I wanna see if the car floods when we hit it when it's cold. Then you have your after start enrichment, which is basically the same thing. So this is the percentage of fuel, and this is the amount of time relative to it. All right, then you have an after start decay rate. Now this is, once it starts, you want it to slowly pull the fuel, the after, after start fuel off. If you cut it off quickly, then it, the engine will die. So this adjusts the amount of time in seconds that you want the after start enrichment tables to be applied. Then we move into the fuel control. I have this turned off. What D-cell fuel cutoff is, uh, the Indians and Victories have this, and so do uh, most cars out there. Basically, when you lift the gas pedal, you'll notice how your, your fuel economy shoots through the roof. That's because it turns off the fuel injectors Well, I, during D-cell. Well, I don't want this car to do this because you, you, have a condition, you have a condition that's manifold wetting. Okay, and, and that's one thing that's, that's a challenge with any fuel injection, regardless of what it is. Basically, if you have a, a dry manifold, it, 
requires more time for the spray when the injector comes back on. It requires more time for that fuel to actually hit the cylinder if the manifold is dry because it has to wet the manifold and then the fuel will actually you know, pop into the, the cylinder and do its job. So I prefer to leave this turned off because I want the manifold to stay wet. I don't want that, that potential instantaneous hiccup when I put, back, uh, put my foot back on the gas. So we're gonna leave that turned off. So that's the fuel related side. Now we move into the sensors. All of this is just outlining each one of the sensors that are all going to exist to some degree in your motorcycle. And this is the scale for that. So I can actually go in and customize the scaling for how I, I want the system to work with each one of the tables. So you have manifold pressure, coolant temperature sensor. Uh, in your case, in a Harley, it's not coolant temperature sensor, it's cylinder head temperature, but it's still the same. Then you have manifold air temperature. You have one of those on your motorcycle. You can set you know, your RPM ranges and of course your battery voltage for different warnings, things like that. And then of course you have your throttle position scale, which again, you also have on your motorcycle. So that's defining all the sensors. Then we move into the parameters. So here we have, of course, eight cylinders. Uh, I've got it in at 427 cubic inches only because I want it to give me a little more duty cycle on the injector when it, it's, it's the math behind it, the algorithm, if you will. So if I, if I run the displacement different here, then it's changing the map globally. You never want to make more than one change at a time if you're trying to diagnose a problem, especially a hard start. So I will not change that number until I get the car to where it starts cold perfectly every time. When it does, I know if I bump that number up, then I need to reduce the, the, the cranking fuel, and I can do that linearly. Uh, I am running the HyperSpark distributor, which is a Hall Effect dis uh, electronic uh, distributor. Uh, reference angle at 57.5 degrees on the ignition, the inductive delay, 100, uh, none of this really matters to you guys, I guess. Then we move into the EFI parameters, sniper system, uh, we're running a Bosch 4.9 LSU sensor, same exact sensors that are in dynos, the same exact sensor that is used to tune your bike, the same sensor that's in the, you know, everything from the Power Vision Auto Tune, the Target Tune, uh, your stuff from Twintech, this uh, Thunder Max, they all run Bosch. LSU sensors like that. Uh, it does have an internal map sensor. Now there, there's also a variance in fuel pressure. Now the, the, the way most fuel injectors are sized is based on an average given operating fuel system pressure. All right, Harleys are done exactly the same way. So if your fuel pressure is different, then it's going to deliver a different amount of fuel. So the way the algorithms work in the software and determining that pulse width of the injector, you have to make sure that you're telling the system what your actual fuel pressure is. So those, the injectors that are in the car are again rated at 100 pounds per hour or 12 and a half grams per second at 60 PSI. Well, mine is actually running, I put in an ultra efficient pump and how I did the lines and everything. I'm actually producing 64 PSI. So I have to tell the system that I've I'm actually running 64 PSI instead of 60. Again, I'm rated at 100 pounds per hour. Uh, the minimum injector opening time, and this is, is relative to just how long I want that injector to, to stay open even if I'm pulling fuel out like crazy. So I know I want 1.2 milliseconds minimum of injector open cycle to get a good spray out of the injector. Now let's move input. None of this applies to us. The closed loop learn. Uh, this is me telling the system how much I want it to correct. Now I can actually go in and, and once I get the car absolutely perfect to account for any anomalies, I can limit the amount that the system will correct. You know, you get, even with cars like you do with motorcycles, you can get a false lean condition from, but it, the problem is more pre prevalent on motorcycles because the exhaust is so short. You can get that false lean condition or reversion. If you've watched my exhaust videos, you'll know what that is. So you can get reversion. Well, with this, I can limit that correction and know that it's not going to, if the, if the, if I don't want it to store that change because again, it's an anomaly. It's not something that's gonna affect how how the vehicle runs too much. All right, next we run into idle. Idle tuning can be incredibly tough. So this is warm, basic 
They're just your idle speed, pretty simple. So I'm running 1,000 RPM up to about 60 degrees, and then I taper it down to at uh, 600 RPM at 180 degrees, and it's pulling a good vacuum at, at 600 RPM. I could raise that to 750, 800, but it has uh, somewhere between 6 and 800, the, the idle vacuum is staying exactly the same. So I'm going to let it run a little, little lower on the idle, plus it sounds good. It goes boogity boogity. Then you have the different settings for your idle control. So this has to do with all the corrections in the system. Like for example, uh, the IC ramp down here, the IC hold positions at 15%. What that means is if I, if I hit the gas really hard and release it really fast, then the IC is gonna hold a position of 15% on the idle air control valve. You have an idle air control valve on your motorcycle, except for fly-by-wire applications, where the throttle plate acts as your idle air control motor. So the throttle plate bounces like this, and sometimes if you, if you have a wide open uh, stage one air cleaner, you'll hear that flip, 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 flip noise coming out of the throttle body. And what that noise is, is the throttle plate, you know, moving and bouncing around to, to acting as an idle air control motor. But this one has an actual idle air control motor on it. So when I release the gas, I know that at 15%, the car won't stall. If, if I had less IC than that, I hit the gas and it as it, it comes back down to idle so quickly, then it can boom and stall. So if I raise that number, that IC hold position, then what's gonna happen is it when I hit the gas, then it's going to maintain a high idle for a long period of time, no different than your motorcycle. You've had that before where the idle will stay up. And a lot of times it's because there's an idle air control motor problem. The, the motor is staying, the pintle is staying up and it's stuck. So that will carry the idle out. That's how it transfers to your motorcycle. The rest of this stuff is really car specific. It's not really going to matter. This is the IC parked position. So this is when you turn it off where the idle air control motor sets the pintle so that it will be in that same place when you go to crank it back up you actually have that same exact setting in your motorcycle. It's just called something different, but it applies. Then we get to the spark tables, quite a few. So this is the ignition table here. Uh, your idle area, to, for reference, is going to be in this area right here. I've got it at about 18 degrees, just because I like a lopy idle. Uh, I could probably, with this cam, get it up to about 22 to 24 degrees at idle, and it would smooth it out a little bit, but I don't have any hesitation when I stomp on it, and I like the way it sounds. So I'm, for now, I'm leaving it at about 18 degrees. Timing all in at 44 degrees on, on steady state cruise, and at... at Full load, wide open throttle, we go from 24 to 34 degrees, but we're all in at 34 degrees at 4,000 RPM. Again, same thing as, as your motorcycle. This is just an important table, but the tables will be different. That's the graph representation of it. Cranking parameters, again, I can assign a different uh, ignition timing at cranking, and you'll notice I have only 10 degrees here. So basically what happens is while I'm cranking it, I'm only at 10 degrees, but if I go back to the base title, uh, to the, the base timing table, once it's running, it's at 18. So I'm pulling eight degrees out while it's cranking just to make it easier for it to start. Now the same thing happens with kickstart motorcycles. So there are some aftermarket ignitions that have what's called a kickstart mode, and you can it will retard ignition timing while you're cranking it. It's no different than how your old bikes work that had the mechanical advanced distributors where you had to twist the hand grip on the left-hand side. Or if you were cranking a Model T or a Model A, it, it all applies. Where basically you're retarding the timing all the way to make it easier to hand crank or make it easier for those old six volt start systems to turn the engine over. And the second you get it running, you advance the timing five, six degrees, give or take, and it'll smooth out. Same exact principle. So that's the graph of it, cranking parameters, your rev limiters. I've just for this one, because the back tire breaks loose, this engine should be capable of 6,500 to 7,000 RPM, but I set it at uh, 5,000 RPM. Quite honestly, at this point, 5,000 RPM, that sucker is screaming and moving pretty good. And uh, the tires break loose so easy, uh, 5,000 RPM is enough. Keep it safe. 
launch retard that has to do is if you're if if i actually had the car set up for a launch then i can retard timing for that that second that i hit the gas it'll retard timing for just a split second to keep from it detonating upon a heavy launch i can also modify the ignition timing based off the coolant temperature now you can do this with your motorcycle as well in this car, you'll notice I have it flatlined at zero all, all the way across the board. I've chosen to be relatively conservative with the ignition timing on it. Now, I because I'm, I'm running non-ethanol fuel, the only non-ethanol fuel I can get in my area is 90 octane. That engine really needs more octane than that. But uh, if I wanted to truly maximize the ignition timing settings, then I would need to be more conscientious of what the coolant temperature is. So as the engine got hotter, I would need to retard the timing a little bit to cool it back down. That's exactly what you have to do to your motorcycle. So there is a table that is ignition timing relative to engine temperature. Then we get timing versus air temperature, same exact thing. You'll notice I'm zeroed out here. Uh, again, at the hotter that the air gets, you would want to retard timing a little bit. You also have that functionality in your motorcycle. Okay. That's a basic overview of the software. So the, the issue that I'm having with the car, again, every time I hit the switch, if it's below 60 to 70 degrees and I hit the switch, it will not start. I have to go into a, a, a flood bypass mode where it's not spraying any fuel at all. I even had it to the point the other day where it was blowing so much fuel, I had raw fuel dripping out of the collector at the header. And we all know that is not safe for that engine. So that's the reason we're here today. We can't have that. And so, uh, now that we know what all the tables mean, let's jump into the car and see if she'll fire up. Now, one of the toughest challenges with the cold start tuning is knowing whether or not you're too rich or too lean as to why it won't start. It's a good general rule of thumb to say that something will never start if it's too lean, but most of the time will start if it's too rich. It's a little easier to figure that out on a motorcycle because you can hit the switch and if it doesn't start, it's pretty easy to pull the plugs and just look at them and see if they're saturated. Well, this one's not so easy to pull the plugs. But I know the size of the injectors. I know how big they are and I know what the settings are. So more than likely, if it doesn't start, it's going to be because it's too rich. So then we just have to slowly and incrementally start pulling fuel out of it. Now, there's a couple other factors, too, that we didn't mention. You have what's called priming fuel as well. And when you turn the switch on, it'll give it a little squirt of fuel just to wet the manifold, as we talked about the manifold wetting, to, to, so that when your cranking fuel starts applying, it's instantaneous and it's not wetting the manifold. It's no different than on a carburetor, wicking the throttle a couple of times or stepping your foot down a couple of times just to pre-wet everything. So... Let's get everything wired up and see where we're at. Now, one of the first things that I want to do is I want to load the map that I have just created. So let's do that. Okay, of course you hear all the noises and everything, so you have the fuel pump that kicked on in the back. The other noise that you're hearing right now, the cam is so big in this car that I had to run an auxiliary electric vacuum pump for the brake booster to have decent brakes. So, as you can hear, uh, hear it, once it got up to 25 inches, uh, the pump shut off. Okay, map's loaded. We'll let it reset. Now, the Sniper EFI system has a what they call a, a flood clear. So you can set the percentage of throttle that you apply when you turn the switch on to deactivate the fuel injectors themselves. So anytime you're doing a test like this, if I were to just turn the switch on to load the map, I would have primed it with fuel, and that completely kills all the settings and where I think I'm at. So you apply the... The, the gas pedal beyond, I have it set at 50%. You apply the gas pedal beyond 50% when you turn the switch on, it kills the injectors so that you can load a map without messing up any of your, your settings. All right, let's give, it a, let's give it a crank and see what she does. It 
almost went. Let's try it one more time. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop right here. I'm gonna say that that's going to be an after start hold off because it seems that the car wanted to start and it hit a couple of times. So even though it's incredibly cold. So what I'm gonna do is go in and make an adjustment to my after start hold off. One other thing I'm, I'm gonna try here real quick is while it's cranking, I want to apply just a small amount to the gas pedal. If I apply a small amount to the gas pedal, and it starts, then that's telling me that I probably need to open up the idle air control motor a little bit, uh, get a little more air in there. I think I ran out of fuel there. Let's see. Let's try it one more time. Perfect. So what I was doing during that time, as the engine's heating up, I'm watching that coolant temp enrichment. I want to see how much the system is trying to correct to achieve the air-fuel ratio and have a good balance of idle and smooth all the way as it progresses through the, uh, the, the temperature ranges. You would do the same thing on a motorcycle. You would start it up, analyze air-fuel ratio immediately, and watch it as it goes from, you know, cold all the way through up until normal operating temperature. And, and that would tell you, you know, a good cycle of your coolant temp enrichment and keeping an eye on that. Now I did shut it off a little early. I shut it off when the coolant temp was at about 140 degrees. So I want the engine to sit for about five to 10 minutes and it's going to heat soak. Believe it or not, at roughly 10 minutes after you shut an engine off is the hottest point the engine will be at. So if I shut it off a little early at, at around that 140 degrees and we wait a few minutes when I turn the switch back on, I'm sure the engine temperature is going to be somewhere around 165 to 170 degrees. So let's wait a few minutes and see where we're at. So let's turn the switch on and see where the engine temperature is now. We're at 167 degrees. Let's see if she starts. Perfect. But uh, now I think we're ready to take it for a test drive. So let's go see how she runs. I'll tell you this car cover, I got this, uh, you know, it's an interior dust cover only, but it's made out of this stretchy material. And this has got to be one of the best car covers I have ever bought it. Uh, bought. It's one of the Eastwood branded ones. And uh, it's really soft uh, inside and out. And, uh, you know, not scratchy at all. And uh, just a really, really nice lightweight dust cover. And what I'm going to do the entire time that I'm driving, I'm going to be keeping an eye on that CL comp percentage and also the learn percentage. Of course, the entire time that I'm driving, it's going to be learning and storing those changes. And then when I get back, we're going to take a look at the, the learn percentage. If you remember that table, we're going to take a look at the learn percentage and then we're going to apply that change. When we apply that change of the learn percentage, it's going to make a change to the volumetric efficiency table, which is going to be the base fuel delivery table. We reset that learn percentage to zero, and then we're pretty much dialed in at that point. Now, if you guys had watched some of the other videos that I did, um, 
when I actually introduced the car, I talked about the suspension and all the stuff that we had to mess with with the, the steering and the alignment on this thing. It was horrible. And uh, my stepdad there did an awesome job setting this thing up, but you know, the headers were massive and I was trying to get trying to get all of the the uh, camber and caster dialed in. Well, I couldn't get the camber and caster dialed in because the upper control arm was hitting the header. You know, it's got uh, over two inch headers on this thing. So I ended up having to pull the headers completely and then uh, pull the control arm, change the, the shape of it to allow clearance. I actually had to cut into the header a little bit and, and pull it in uh, in order to get enough clearance just to get enough, uh, get enough camber and caster on it. But other than that, she drives drives and tracks straight. The brakes, of course, had to go through and do a bunch of stuff, do a bunch of work to the brakes. Uh, so, but she stops stops pretty good now. If you if you hit the brakes multiple times, then you'll start to lose vacuum. Uh, the the pump that I got from Lead is is a fantastic piece, but the uh, it, you know an electric pump can only build uh, pull vacuum so quick so for a power brakes to work effectively they need at least 15 15 inches 15 to 18 is ideal so if you hit the brakes multiple times you'll start to get some brake fade so you just have to kind of get used to that now when I step on the gas hard you're gonna hear that whistling noise it is not a fan belt slipping <laughs> it's, it's characteristic of this Holly throttle body uh, to, to make that noise when you first stomp on it. Uh, you can actually add a spacer plate underneath the throttle body that'll reduce that, but uh, I don't have the room under there, so I'll just tolerate it and deal with it. Everything's working exactly like it should. I'm sure you probably heard that little whistling noise there. One thing about this car, when you, when you hit it, uh, it, it does push to one side. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of power torquing on these control arms on the rear of this thing. And then, of course, it is a, a uh, limited slip, so it's locking both wheels up, so it'll push to one side a little bit. Now, let's see how she comes back down to an idle. Ramp down exactly like I wanted it to. Fuel still looks good. Good stable idle. Perfect. Ah, uh, she handles like a dream. And of course, I can't. Uh, of course, I can't leave you guys without a uh, <laughs> without a good old shot. Let's see what she does wide open throttle. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Fun, fun. Okay, guys, thanks a million for coming along with me for the ride. If you don't know the story behind this car, I'm going to put up a link to the car that started it all. You can learn a lot more about this car and what it means to me and why it's so special. Of course, some of the other modifications that I've made to it. And of course, I'm going to put a link down here to all of our other Harley playlists. And if you browse through that, you're going to find a ton of videos on the basics of fuel injection and be able to see how more of the most popular motorcycle software works. Guys, I appreciate you very much. I'd like to wish all of you a very happy new year, and I'm sure in the next couple of days we're going to be throwing up another video. Take care of yourselves and each other. Have a good one.